here. If this works out today, you will never think of surgery the same way again. Uh, and hopefully, you'll never think of anything else the same way again. Certainly. And if I survive and don't fall off the stage, this will be great. Um, this is my favorite picture of my dad. He is in a car, having a ball, and he's thumbs up mugging for the camera as he's winning a race, oblivious to the fact that there are two dozen cars chasing him desperately. And he's so far out in front, he's just goofing around for my uncle who took the picture. And that's his Lotus 6, and it's one of his favorite cars. And he's having a ball. He had fun his whole life, 26,922 days of enthusiasm, nonstop. Um, I talked to him one night, and he was carving yet another bird, who just put another piece on his house. And it was great. I really loved it. And I, I always loved talking to him. And then, next morning, uh, actually next afternoon, I got one of those calls, the one you don't want to get. He was gone. That's it. No warning. Uh, that was it. And uh, <sighs> he was my inspiration, and he believed in me when I didn't. And he let me do anything I wanted if I thought I could try it, and if I didn't think I could try it, he kicked my ass so I would. <laughs> um, but he did something that was pretty interesting. He, he was always playing, and he always made it fun, no matter what, no matter how scary or hard it was. Today, what we're going to do is underneath the surgical technology we're going to be talking about, we're going to be challenging assumptions. And in fact, we're going to be talking about a slightly different kind of assumption, the hidden assumptions. The hidden assumptions that you all have now control your life. If you don't know about them, they govern you. And they prevent you from seeing something that's right under your nose that you could do. Um, but luckily, there's an antidote. Uh, my colleague, Hugh Crenshaw, who's out here, and I were unpacking this the other day, trying to figure out why were we always in on these interesting um, uh, adventures together. And uh, the latest one is a surgical robotics company. And this is the prescription. If you remember nothing else from this talk, remember these two words. This is how you discover your hidden assumptions and destroy them and gain control of your company or your life or anything. Uh, surprise. A lot of people just blow by it. You know, they're kind of, I'm busy, I gotta do stuff like this, and you go, whoosh, you go right by it. And surprise is the universe's way of saying happy birthday, here's a piece of the world that you get to see, that you wouldn't normally see. And we need to remember that surprise is important. Okay, first story. Boats, 50,000 years ago, some kid jumped on a log and paddled it and created naval architecture. We know about this because people got to Australia before there was any land bridge and there wasn't, and they were there. And ever since then, aircraft carriers and 747s and trains and cars all like to be right side up. And the interesting thing about that is that the right side up is an assumption. This is uh, Robert Whitehead, uh, torpedo. He made torpedoes. They actually worked. They blew up ships. They were steampunk robots. They had flywheels inside. They were spun up by steam engines. The flywheel controlled feedback, and the thing went straight as an arrow and actually was able to blow up ships. This stayed right side up, even though there isn't a captain on board with a teacup to spill in his lap. This doesn't stay right side up. Uh, my colleague Hugh Crenshaw, was, uh, he got his PhD at Duke University, and he was studying how microorganisms swim. And these microorganisms swim in a helix. Almost everything that's small swims in a helix. And what's interesting is that people knew this for 100 years. And Hugh thought that was really cool. And he went and looked up the literature on why they do this. And there was nothing. Nada. And that was surprising to him. And so he looked into it. And the short story is he actually created an entire mathematical model that was the first time anyone ever described this. And he broke it down into rules. And it was wonderful. And he was presenting on stage, and I was thinking about, I'm always thinking about machines and vehicles and everything like that, and I'm watching him on stage, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, you could build one of those. And later, we're having a beer, and we've got a Guinness coaster, and we're drawing this crazy thing on there, and we're, we're thinking the same thing. We could build one of these things. This is going to be fun. Let's try it. So we talked to DARPA. We got a million dollars, and we built them, and they work. 
And they have one moving part. Six degree of freedom control, three of translation, three of rotation, one moving part, and they work. And it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, I'm going to show you a video. You're going to see a little spinning thing through a microscope, and it's how the microorganisms move. And then you're going to see Hugh in the pool releasing a robot. All right, so what you're going to see is a microorganism is going to be spinning through the water. And then you're going to see the robot spinning through the water. It was taken 572 years ago, so it's very, very old uh, that video. A uh, hue is cruel to our poor little robots. They have a little light sensor on them, so they spin around and scan the environment, and he points it at the darkest part of the pool. Well, it doesn't care. It sees a little light gradient, and it spins around. And DARPA was a little surprised. They said, hey, how's that project go? How is it going? And, and we said, well, it works 100% of the time. And DARPA said, we don't believe you. They set down two statisticians, and the two statisticians called back DARPA and said, we have a problem. It works 100% of the time. They were telling the truth. So we put barriers in there, and we put, um, uh, we put all kinds of, uh, we put a live Navy SEAL in the water to try and prevent them from getting the light, and they got there anyway. And the interesting thing is, um, the thing about this, a, a big primate, he's really smart, he could see what was going on, and, and no, no, he lost. Um, so the, the first lesson is that Hugh had a surprise, and I had a surprise. His was that no one ever looked at this. Mine was that, that there was something that didn't do everything, this, the same thing everyone else did. And what was happening here, the lesson is study history irreverently. You can also use biology as a fake alternative history, because for three and a half billion years, the good designs have been eating the bad designs. And so there tend to be good designs. It's worth copying. And you should cultivate beginner's mind, because I had no damn idea what I was doing. And it was great, because I didn't have anything to unlearn. Um, and, OK, second story. Two and, a half million, two and a half million years ago, somebody banged some rocks together, created some sharp edges, and created a thing that could cut. This is the dawn of surgery. About 60,000 years ago, 60,000 years ago, someone took a sliver of bone and figured out how to sew with it and put things back together again. That's the dawn of plastic surgery. Now, 10,000 years ago, we have evidence of people surviving this process. And what's interesting, <laughs> that's 50,000 years of trouble. <clears throat> so this is uh, an Egyptian tomb carving 2,500 years ago. And what's really, really scary is that the instruments in the kit that Jay Walker so graciously lent which are Civil War era, look almost exactly like these. I can name piece after piece after piece, and they're the same. The problem is, when you see a modern kit, it looks like that one, which looks like that one, which means Egyptians could come into a hospital and say, oh, I know what all that stuff is, and that is either design stasis or we're not actually moving anything forward. <clears throat> Now, I'm a biomechanist. I study how biomechanics influences things. And then maybe the Egyptians were prescient, and they were absolutely fantastic at biomechanics, and they knew exactly what they were doing, or maybe it's just sort of well, how we do things. OK, so I hope you're getting pictures of the really, really scary implements. Basically, they're hunks of steel. This thing, which I need to come up. If I break this, Jay will get me. This is a hunk of steel. Before this, it was a hunk of bronze. Before this, it was a hunk of bone. And before this, it was fingers. This is many, many more times powerful than it needs to be. And the problem is, this is made out of steel, and you are not made out of steel. We're going to talk about that in a second here. So um, surgical robots. We tried to figure out, if we're going to do surgical robots, how can we help the greatest number of people? Well, in fact, uh, the greatest number of people with the greatest number of pain are people who have thoracotomies. You take the knife and you slice through the ribs, and you take one of these nasty things, and you, let's see if I can do this, you crank it open. And it cranks open in sudden jerks, um, kind of like the guys on the highway. All right, <laughs> here's why we're doing open surgery. Open surgery, that's so old, it's like ancient. That giant blue Pac-Man up, uh, Pac up there is 90% of chest surgeries which are open. Now, if you look up there, you'll see that we spent billions of dollars. We have 10,000 papers or more in the last 10 years. There's 30 years of innovation. There's robots. There's mini thoracotomies. There's VATS, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. All of that stuff together is less than 10%. Why? Because you're asking surgeons to change. Remember the Egyptian tomb carving. <clears throat> So, in 1936, Enrico Finichetto, he created something called the retractor that I just showed you. Hmm? So, 
the thing is, that's 75 years. The picture on the right is, in fact, a catalog picture. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Another example of technological progress in less time, we've gotten a little bit farther. <laughs> and I think maybe we can do a little bit better with that retractor. OK, let's see what happens here. OK, this is that old nasty retractor. This is a video by Ex Vivo. And they're guys, they're great. And you can torture them with all kinds of changes at the last minute, and they'll still do it. So um, what's happening up in the upper right, which is really nasty, is that there's little nerves that run underneath our ribs. And if you crush those nerves, you will not have those nerves working anymore. That Once they're out, they're gone. You get uh, uh, like a crushing nerve injury. You get phantom pain. The uh, ribs break. It, uh, this is about the most biomechanically egregious thing you can do to a body. And this is because all of you out there are a composite hierarchical viscoelastic beasts. You are feeling, thinking uh, creatures. You and I, we're all made of collagen and snot and a few mineral salts. <laughs> the uh, simpler way to do it is that you're made out of fibers and goo. And the problem is, fibers and goo, so fibers and goo don't like to be jerked around fast. That retractor that you saw does that. This is some goo. This is a stand-in for a patient. Um, I was actually thinking about looking at maybe another sort of a, uh, and there was or all kinds of orifices or orifices that we could have and examine, but Katie Couric already did that one, so I'm not going to myself. Uh, and you made me follow that guy, are you kidding me? This is fibers and goo. <laughs> so, here's what's gonna happen. This is us on the finichetto. That's not good. However, if you're nice and easy, and you're nice and smooth, not slow, but smooth, you can pull it apart. OK, this is the old way on the bottom. That spiky thing is a force graph. You don't want that. That's what everyone gets every 15 seconds on the planet Earth. A human chest is cracked open with a 75-year-old design, and it is not a metaphor. That cracking is loud. It's like lettuce tearing or snapping sticks. The trace on the top is what we get when we put a motor and sensors the green thing is what I want. If I have to get open, I want the green guy. Because the red guy has two broken ribs. And broken ribs are common. There are people who tell us that it happens every time. There are people who happen, ha tell us that it happens more than half the time. And I'm, let's see here. Ah, there we go. This is the new way. Smooth sensors. Sensors are paying attention to the forces in the tissue. It's designed to go in easy. It automatically grabs the tissue. You can see the things underneath there. We don't go anywhere near the nerves. Doctor says, don't do that. If it hurts, we don't. And we actually changed about 20, 30 different things about the old retractor. The idea is that I, old funny idea of first knew no harm. So what it is, is we don't approach design. I don't approach design of these things like a surgeon. I approach it like a uh, biomechanist. Uh, this, is the, this is the payoff right here. The red line is what happens to the nighttime respiratory rate of an animal in a study we did. There are actually five animals on that. And what happens is, is that it's there at nighttime respiratory rate, it's nice and easy, it's normalized, you do surgery, and it's way out of whack. It's breathing fast, it's in pain, we think, and in fact, um, it has rescue analgesia on some of those animals. And what's happening here is that um, they, they're, they're also, um, uh, their blood oxygen is below normal. I don't want to be the animal in red. The green line is what happened when we used the efficient retractor. The animals remained normal. They're breathing more regularly, like I am now. <laughs> and they actually had normal blood oxygen, normal breathing. And it's kind of, you kind of wonder, do they even qualify for ICU? OK. There's uh, one of the versions of the NACE retractor. You can go out to the booth, and you can uh, go see this stuff and play with it yourself. Um, uh, just one thing, by the way, we wanted to run this thing, we wanted to try different retractor interfaces, so we, made a, we became an Apple app developer, and we made a bunch of apps, so open heart surgery, there is an app for that, no lie. Uh, we're going to do everything on the surgical tray. Basically, all these people that are really smart that don't know anything about what you're doing, you get her over there in your lab and look at your retractable, uh, retra uh, your hard problem. And then the other thing is, is pursue surprise. The last thing I want to say is this. When I got the news that my father was dead out of the blue, it broke my heart. He was my hero. He was an inventor. He was an engineer. He did everything. 
And I think there's more than a little poetry in responding to his loss by making a machine to gently coax open the chest for a little repair on the heart. Thank you.